So uh, this is the start of our uh, founder workshop uh, series. And uh, for today, uh, we have uh, invited Justin, who is the, co the creator and also founder of uh, Safari. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, um, uh, Justin will start uh, sharing more about uh, uh, will share more about uh, Safari, and then uh, after he finished, uh, uh, we will have also a session for any question that uh, you you may have. So yeah, Justin, thanks again uh, for uh, uh, join us on uh, this first uh, uh, workshop uh, series. Sounds good. Happy to be here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Can you see it? Yeah, I can confirm that we can see it. Okay. Awesome. So what we're going to talk about today are really four things. Uh, first, why community-led growth is the future of growth. Second, where a lot of Web3 communities went wrong in terms of building community, uh, how to build a great community, and, and tactics for doing so. So a short little bit about me. I'm Justin. Uh, I spent the last five years working in growth, primarily in labor marketplaces in Web2. Uh, so an example of that is my most recent company was called Winolo, which is Uber for warehouse workers, trying to get warehouse workers daily work shifts. Um, and so I'm a community builder turned product manager back to turn it, turned growth marketer and then experimentation platform builder. So I've done a little bit of different aspects of growth before I came to Web3. And I really dove into the space by starting to write about Web3 back in January on my Twitter that I had just started at the time under the pseudonym Jakey, um, which is uh, which means Justin's key. Um, and so I, uh, yeah, was summarizing a lot of content and that really helped me understand Web3 and, and where we're going as a space. And I noticed that there weren't that many people talking about Web3 growth or how to grow Web3 companies. So I founded Safari, which is a community of world-class growth leaders and community builders exploring the Web3 ecosystem. Our members hail from Uniswap, OpenSea, Ledger, Unstoppable Domains, CoinMarketCap, Dapper Labs, and 200 other Web3 projects. And our mission is to build the Web3 growth playbook together collectively with data. So uh, some of these learnings and things that I'll share with you represent uh, many, many conversations within Safari over the last six months since we launched in February. And our vision overall for both our community and our industry is to make growth collaborative. We believe that Web3 growth is not zero sum and that we need to work together and share what works to evangelize the Web3 ecosystem. So let's dive in. So first we're gonna talk about why community-led growth is the future of growth. And you've probably seen how Web3 companies are all about building communities, um, but why is that? And yes, we love privacy, and yes, we love the vibes, and yes, crypto is still small and we can mostly fit around the campfire together. I believe that there's also a larger trend here playing out in Web2 that, sh that helps explain to us why uh, communities are on the rise in Web3. And so this is the trend that no one wants to see, but we all know to be the case is that CAC is rising and it's doing so for a number of different reasons. Um, so CAC, for, for those who might not know, is the cost, uh, customer acquisition costs, how much it costs to acquire your customers or users. And the, the really big wake up call for a lot of brands happened actually in Q1 of this year when, ne when the Netflix earning report came out. It, it was like all that any growth leader could talk about. Um, and so last year, for Q1, Netflix spent 500 million for their marketing budget to acquire 4 million subscribers, so $125 CAC. And they forecasted that they would do less this quarter, um, so less, less last quarter for 2.5 million instead of four, uh, but they actually only got 0 0.5. Um, so that's a $1,000 CAC, so 8X increase just in one year. And many are calling this the canary in the coal mine, an early trend early indication of the trend to come. So 
rising CAC has been on people's minds for a while now, um, and privacy changes, competition, and slowing internet growth penetration are all part of the problem. So I want to show you guys the Web2 funnel before we, we dive in to help explain some of these changes that are going on in Web3. And so this Web2 funnel might look familiar to you. You want to make your consumers aware of your products, get them to sign up, activate, convert uh, to paid, and then retain them. And you generate awareness via social media platforms like search engines and other ad platforms to drive traffic to your first party website or application. And Web2 growth, uh, if anything, really centers around user attention. And as we mentioned with CAC, that attention is becoming increasingly expensive. So how does the Web3 growth funnel differ? Uh, most Web3 projects, as we've talked about, take a community-led approach. And so the funnel is the same, but the platforms are different. So unlike in Web2, your first party application is often not where you nurture your users. If Web2 is about attention, Web3 is about engagement. That's why the Web3 funnel, I changed it to how many, from how many to who. Who and how often is the most important. In Web2, you're directing attention from social, search, and ad platforms to your website. And in Web3, you're generating engagement or attention within and across third-party platforms. So as I'm sure you guys are aware, Twitter is the main channel through which users discover most Web3 projects. Um, and so though DeFi is a notable exception, since getting listed on an exchange is also a big discovery vehicle, for the most part, Twitter is the front page of Web3 today. And so community engagement or retention happens in Discord, like where we are today, and revenue is transacted via on-chain apps. So Web3 growth is a lot less about driving attention to your app, and more so about meeting your users where they are and fostering deep engagement within those channels. So you engage deeply up front to get buyers over the high cost purchase moment with certain types like NFT collections or Web3 games, uh, and then you can consider yourself done in a way. There's not a post-purchase engagement strategy like there is in Web2. That's one of the ways the Web3 communities are so valuable, is that your pre and your post activation strategies for different segments become part of the same effort. It becomes this group bot purchasing decision in which you are trying to create great vibes in your community and drive interconnectedness among members, uh, which drives this word of mouth flywheel and engagement loop. So differentiation, one of the, one of the, the results of, of CAC uh, rising and getting so high uh, makes differentiation and retention more important than ever. So in Web2, marketers made the case that they mined all this user data to personalize experiences. And honestly, the experience, experiences did not live up to that promise. So as reaching customers online becomes increasingly expensive, these two things, differentiation and customer attention, should be the at the top of your mind, and communities can help with both. And there are three reasons that I tend to think about for, for how communities can help with differentiation and retention. One is that it brings, close, brings customers closer to the product development process, which also increase, increases consumer ownership and the ability for a brand to get it right for their customers. Second is that community is really differentiated go-to-market strategy that involves building a brand alongside your customers and transforming them into brand champions sometimes before the product even exists. Uh, that's been the case for, for Safari, which we can get into um, later on. The third is that it enables a more personalized connection between the brand and the consumer. So in Web2, one of the main ways to reach and communicate with your consumers is through really impersonal mass email outbound um, or them talking to your customer service representatives. And so with communities, brands can become more human and thus more trustworthy. So there's another big element of why communities are important and, and particularly now. Now, more than ever, people are searching for communities. And so the, there are a few obvious reasons. One is that COVID really escalated feelings of loneliness and made it really hard to create community IRL. The second big one is that the great resignation and a lot of shifts in our workforce are driving a real sense of purpose. COVID also escalated some of these feelings, but people 
more more often than not now are looking for you know ways to engage people and really find value and, and meaning in their life and make an impact. And I think that's in particular too why why DAOs have gone become um, so popular. The third is is really that economic injustices by intermediaries are, are fueling resentment. So this also drives people toward communities and wanting to do things together rather than paying intermediaries to uh, get the job done for them. And on the benefit for the company side, communities create multipliers. So on the acquisition front, organic word of mouth to grow your customer base, retention, customers come for the tool and they stay for the network. LTV, engaged customers are more likely to be repeat customers and champions. And then moot, you can replicate the technology, but you can't replicate the people. You could create a, a great GCR with the same uh, frameworks and processes and everything else. Um, but if it if you created a, a replicate replicate community, uh, the people would be different, and that would really shape the the difference in how the community acts and is run as well. And finally, recruiting a community member could be your next employee. I mean, many don't know this, but Jiho from Axie actually started as a community member and a gamer, and and rose up to the C-suite. Uh, there's a lot of great uh, articles out there about uh, yeah how he how he uh, got involved in the game early and that launched him into being a co-founder of Axie. So now we're going to talk a little bit about community done wrong. Um, and I think that this is where things really started to go astray in the, the bull market for Web3 communities, which is the first big one is that your audience is not your community. Just because you put your, your audience into a Discord, that doesn't make it a community. And we saw this a lot with Web3 communities over the past six months, is that there were just a ton of people you didn't know in the Discord together, and those people also didn't know each other. So let me make it clear. Communities are groups of aligned users. So in audiences, one individual member or brand communicates asym asymmetrically to all the other nodes. None of those recipients are connected, and the one-to-many makes audience networks powerful for clear and consistent communication. They're a lot easier to control, but they're much more fragile because if the brand or the creator, community head of community, uh, or you know, yeah, creator is removed, they collapse. But in community networks, and so this this diagram highlights a community network, nodes are interconnected. So this many-to-many -many design is what differentiates a community from an audience. It's much more difficult to build a community at first, but these networks are much more resilient. There's no single point of failure. And so some communities might start as audience networks, but they, involve, they evolve by cultivating two key concepts. First is node interconnectivity. So how many people within the community personally know each other, within the audience that becomes a community personally know each other, and how do you cultivate that? And the second is shared utility. So what can you do to have community members provide value directly to each other with the brand as the facilitator, but not the, not the direct link? So the more interconnected communities are more resilient, the more they become resilient. And to increase shared utility, owners must increase the benefit that each node receives from their participation in that community. And so when, we, when I really think, thought deeply about uh, why communities weren't working in Web3 over the last few, few months and before I started Safari, uh, it really came down to design for me, is that Discord acquisition is easy. Uh, there are a lot of people that are putting uh, lots of bots into their Discord or just driving, driving FOMO and hype to their, their uh, Discord and getting lots of numbers. But engagement and retention are actually what you want. You know, Discord is your mid funnel, uh, so this is where you do that activity, and those things are really hard. And so, many of the communities that we saw over the last six to nine months were optimized for getting as many people as possible into their Discord to drum up hype. Um, but instead, many of them got a mostly dead Discord. Uh, there is there is a saying among Web three growth leaders that who did a lot of successful NFT collections that you needed about 50,000 members in your Discord to sell out a collection. That's a lot of people, uh, most of whom were not engaged. So 
The other big problem with these huge, large open communities is that they're really susceptible to bad actors. There's no shortage of scammers and spammers on Discord, and that makes running open communities really, really difficult. One of the third reasons of one of the third design elements that that I take issue with is text-based communities. They're a pain to moderate and they're a pain to find value from. As a community manager, you're constantly moderating, summarizing, organizing, and reorganizing information uh, to, to, in order to enable uh, people to get value from, from your text-based community. So in my opinion, community success requires intentionality from day one and also requires a growth mindset. So when I saw these problems in uh, with Web3 communities before I started Safari, I literally just thought to myself, I'm gonna do the exact opposite of every single one of these things, and we're gonna see how it goes. So communities are incredibly unique, and the best communities arise from really thoughtful research and investment, and honestly, there are very few shortcuts. Community is not a set it and forget it channel. And if you think about you know, email marketing and other ways to engage users in, in, in Web2, often those aren't set it and forget it channels either. Engagement and retention are uh, something that you need to dedicate time to, but it's also where you get really high returns. Um, so your community builder's job, as I mentioned before, um, for now, to make your community, your audience into a community or to ensure that your community is a real, real community, two things, your connectivity between people and shared utility. And so your community member, one, ideally should be somebody who identifies with that community. And two, your builder's job is to find all the little ways to create shared value and produce something together that no individual community member or brand could on their own. It has, community has high ROI, but it also takes a ton of work. Um, it's your, you should think about community as, as your brand, your customer service department, and your referral engine all in one. Oh, there are three types of communities that I tend to think about, and this is important before you think about designing your first community. First is communities of product. So. These are members of these communities are focused primarily on discussing and learning about a specific product, probably that you've created. So Salesforce Trailblazers, Twilio's Champions, uh, those are examples of communities of product. Communities of practice, uh, these are all about leveling up a discipline or a craft or a skill and connecting with other practitioners in potentially or, or not potentially independent of any tool or platform. So some examples of this are cohort-based learning communities like OnDeck um, or uh, learning communities like Safari uh, for growth leaders and Invisible College for, for learners. And then the final one is communities of play. So members of this category come together around a common interest. You can think about this as NFT communities or gaming communities or sports communities or arts communities or athletics communities. There are many of them. Um, but I think it's it's important to ground yourself in around thinking about which of the ty different types of communities am I building. And when you start to build a community, you should build a community in the exact same way that you built a product. You first need to identify your user segments, and and think about you know who are the who are the people that are coming into my community. What are the different types of people? Uh, what are, what goals do they have? What motivations do they have? What would be the ideal member profile for somebody in my community? And then once you really understand and figure out who is going to be the right people in your community, because as I mentioned, this is a really a core differentiator is audience is about how many. It's all about eyeballs. It's just about uh, getting as many people to absorb and purchase your content as possible, engage with your content. A community is really about who. It's about uh, creating connections between your most valuable users um, and having them get value from you and from each other. And so the getting value from you and each other is the value prop. What is the value prop that your community specifically as a community provides? Uh, I think this is another trap where people are like, communities are great. And 
just throw all these people together and there will be value. But no, you really need to be intentional about thinking, you know, what is the value prop for our community specifically? And the final point here is vision. So I really think that um, one of the great things in Web3 overall is this aspect of decentralized storytelling, which is really just storytelling. It's thinking about what is our collective narrative for our community uh, and how does this drive and acquire people moving forward. So as an example, I shared, I shared at the beginning that Safari's vision is to make growth collaborative. It's a vision for our industry. Um, and I actually wrote this notion page on our website more than six months ago. I haven't changed it since and it still resonates. So that's uh, what in my mind makes for a, a good vision um, is broad enough that it can uh, encapsulate all the twists and turns that your uh, community is going to uh, go through, uh, but specific enough that it really appeals to a certain segment. So this is sort of a concrete uh, visualization of the different things that I've been th talking about for our community, is that the key is every community needs utility. And what is that utility going to look like? You need to first understand who are the people in your community and then figure out what do they want uh, to do. So. For us, when we first started Safari, we thought that Web3 growth leaders and Web3 founders would be our bread and butter segments. Um, and so, but when we started mapping this out, we found that there was this whole uh, group of Web2 growth leaders who are actually extremely engaged in Safari uh, for very complementary reasons to the Web3 growth leaders. Um, and we also led in and experimented with, with other segments as well so other segments include crypto vcs um, and corporate innovators corporate innovators are who we who we think of as people who are leading web3 strategy at a very large web2 uh, brand and so here are the some of the motivations that we discovered by by talking to them uh, and really figuring out what they wanted in the community is many of them were looking for a curated growth network they said this time and time and again is that what Safari can provide them is access to the top 200 Web3 growth leaders in our space to talk about any problem under the sun across different uh, stages of company. So early stage, mid stage, late stage, um, and also lots of different verticals. So we have growth leaders from infrastructure projects, L1s, L2s, NFTs, GameFi, and many, many more segments. Um, and so these are, this is sort of, I think, what you really need to have in your minds is who are the people in our community, what segments are they part of, and what, is the, what does that make them care about? And once you figure out what, the, what their motivations are, then you can deliver a value prop to them uh, that gives them a lot of value. Now we're going to run through some tactics on how this all really comes together and through my personal experience with Safari. So one of the big things, as I mentioned, is open communities are really, um, one, uh, they uh, drop a lot of potential scammers, uh, which makes people not want to stay in your Discord server. Uh, they also attract a lot of spammers, so people uh, looking to your community to uh, just get value in some kind of way and get value usually potentially at, at the detriment of the community itself. Uh, so by spamming their, their project and all sorts of things all over the place. Um, but we, you know, we made Safari a closed community. And so as I mentioned, audience is about how many and communities are about who. Communities are about getting your 100 true fans together in a Discord and really vibing with them and delivering on a value prop that matters. And all these Web3 large Discord communities, they're like 50,000, 100,000 people. And the community managers are running around frantically trying to get you know, 10, 20, 30 people engaged. Um, and you can really just do that with a very different, higher leverage model. Most companies are still at the point where they're looking for their 100, 100 plus true fans. And you could really spend a lot less time doing like admin and frustrating things and just design your community in a different way to make it more intimate. So as an example of this, uh, Safari is closed. And one of the other benefits of 
I guess we'll get to the other bed after they're closed. Um, so yeah, keep it intimate. Second, as we mentioned, define the segments and test the value prop. We started with certain segments in Safari. We changed to realize that others were actually higher and more engaged. And we designed our community from day one to be optimized around engagement. Um, so everything that we do, we think about engagement. We don't think about how many people are in it. And engagement also drives acquisition of FOMO uh, just in a very direct value-based way. So batching strategy. If you have a closed community, a benefit is that you can let people in at the same time with the same expectations. And this, in my opinion, is what makes great onboarding. So let's talk about what, what isn't great onboarding. If you have an open Discord server, then anyone can join at any time. And that creates a lot of chaos because maybe they join your Discord server when most of the other people in the server are asleep. Uh, or in a different time zone. And so they might go through the server and they're like, oh, maybe it's not as active as I hoped. Um, and once the once they churn, they're gone forever um, in, in almost all circumstances. So that is a uh, so batching strategy. What this means is that we in Safari have people sign up to join our community, and then we wait. And we wait usually uh, for our community a month or more to let people in. Um, but for your community, it could be even just a few days. Understanding your community members before they join uh, is really, really valuable for one, figuring out the segments that they're part of, two, uh, thinking about what might drive them to be a great community member. And three is that when they when they join and when they join in these batches and groups, it creates this excitement and, and um, and they join at the same time with the same expectations and we really make it an experience. And I believe that amazing onboarding is key to great community building. And every batch that we let in in Safari is also a chance to experiment with something new. So you might not know when people join your, your Discord server today, whether they're, they're truly um, engaged in getting value um, and you might not have a chance to experiment with new things. So this is a way that we've created um, unique onboarding experiences within Safari by throttling membership up front and then delivering a great experience once they're able to actually join our community. So onboarding calls, obviously probably not the most scalable thing for most communities, um, but at the same time, they can create a lot of value for you as a community build builder to really learn about what is the value prop for your community um, and how people are where people's segments are coming from and how they're driving their community. So in Safari, we actually, for the third batch, our most recent batch, we offered one-on-one -on -one onboarding calls to every new member. The only people, so there are only two of us that run Safari. And so in our third batch, we, we invited 80 people to join our community and 60 of them signed up to have a call with us. And it was really, really a huge value add for, for me personally as a community member. I mean, for a community builder, and I can tell you that my co-founder, um, although he's not as close to the community, also got a lot out of it as well. Um, and if you think about scale, we were inspired by Jeff, who runs Jump, which is a marketing community. He is is on the record as having done 700 onboarding calls uh, with Jump members in the last year. Uh, so while that may be a bit extreme, there's a lot of benefits that can come from creating these types of connections with your community members up front. And so the second thing that comes with that is our matching strategy. So we all, another thing that we use these onboarding calls for is to um, match Safari members with other Safari members as soon as they join. So as I mentioned, Communities, by, to create a community means that you want your community members to be as interconnected as possible. And personally in Safari, we have a hypothesis that if a new member meets us through an onboarding call, then they get value from one other member that we match them to. And then other people, and they enjoy both of those experiences and think that it was worth their time. And, and by matching and onboarding calls, I really do mean a one-on-one -on -one conversation between us and them and then them and another member. Let's talk about anything. Um, and we hypothesize if they have those two 
um, connection points that they're much more likely to trust the value of our network. And so when people reach out to them and they see that you know their mutual Safari um, connection, they're in the same Discord, that they will accept the, accept the match, and that also um, increases the interconnectivity of our community. So as I mentioned, we focus on engagement over everything else. And I think that the really key thing about engagement is to optimize around one core um, action. And so it can be really tempting within your community to say, you know, we want our members to be, you know, engaged in these channels and talking in these workshops and doing these things. Um, but that makes it it hard in the user's mind to to understand where they can get value, where they can get the most value from your community, um, and how they're supposed to engage. Uh, a lot of community members, when we did calls with them, would say like, you know, we read the material, that's great, but you know, how do I, you know, participate in Safari? What does that look like? And over the course of these batches, we really had to center around a key engagement metric. So for us, as I mentioned text-based communities are really annoying to moderate. That's my personal opinion. And I think that if you're a community member in Web3, you've probably seen the same. And so for our community, we also have our community Discord, but we default to audio over text. So our one engagement action that we try and drive people towards is hosting a weekly call on Web3 growth case studies and other advanced growth topics at the same exact time every single week. So it becomes a ritual that brings members back and also reduces churn. So we'll see that there'll be a lot of, uh, there'll be dormancy through in our community throughout the week. And then when community calls happen, we tend to have around 30 to 40 different members on our calls every week. This is out of a community of 200. So this also goes to show, you know, a lot of what I saw in Discord servers is there would be thousands and thousands of people, but they really struggle to get people to uh, come onto calls. And so, um, and that was a great opportunity for members to meet each other and for the brand to express uh, what the values of the community were. And so this is really our engagement action that we care about the most is that our community members are busy heads of growth at different Web3 companies. And so we know that they don't have a lot of time to uh, be searching around Discord for different things. And so we say to them, the value prop of Safari is very clear. We'll, meet, we'll match you with somebody when you first join, so you meet somebody new. And we're going to deliver value to you week over week through this one hour call every week. Same time, same place, you, you know the deal. Um, and so this is um, where this, this is really where you can start to create shared utility. Uh, so for us, um, this is where I, I think that community members, community builders need to spend the most time thinking, how do people in my community engage and how do they create shared value? So another big thing for these calls, right? In the beginning, we did, created all the content ourselves uh, and it was this crazy juggling act and we realized that one, that wasn't super scalable from a uh, standpoint of like me spending nights and weekends trying to create, generate new content on, on Web3 growth, but also like people didn't really wanna hear from, from me all the time either. And as our community matured and Web3 growth leaders became more confident in their skills, uh, we started having all things like this, like this workshop, bringing in uh, cur current Safari members to talk to other Safari members about various different growth topics, um, and especially to really uh, go with our vision of having uh, Web3 growth leaders uh, share openly and collaborate even among competitors. Uh, we'll, bring, we'll often bring competitive, competing projects to talk about their growth strategies and challenges uh, live in front of the rest of the community. So those are, are some key elements. Um, oh yeah, this was the design for members to create shared value. Um, and setting a, a bold vision. Um, so this is, as I mentioned before, our bold vision in Safari is a vision for our industry uh, to make Web3 growth collaborative um, in a way that it wasn't before. And so members reverse engineer growth strategies together and speak on panels about their growth strategies and challenges. And another big one about 
uh, community building is to not to forget to differentiate. Remember that communities are great because they're different. People are unique. Every single new cohort that comes into Safari changes the dynamics of what we do in some kind of way, just by virtue of the fact there being a new group of people in our community. So this is really important to remember. People naturally differentiate communities, but also you need to think about how your community is different from other communities. And the last point here is everything we do in communities is highly experimental and you really need to embrace that as a, as a growth leader and as a community builder um, is that, as I mentioned, each new batch changes the dynamics of Safari and our community. Community building is just like product building. You always need to be testing and retesting different things with new segments as those segments evolve. Um, and so that is it for me. Happy to answer any questions that anyone might have on community building or how I see the future of growth. Uh, thanks, uh, Justin. Uh, really appreciate for sharing all those tips on how to like uh, build the community and also uh, growth tactics. So yeah, really appreciate. Uh, now uh, the floor is open for adding this if they have any questions so yeah they can uh unmute themselves or if they can't uh feel free just to write on our public voice uh, chat and uh we will answer so me and justin will will answer uh your your question hello can you hear me yeah, 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 so, and size. Uh, awesome talk, I really enjoyed it. And uh, my question is, uh, do you see any other projects in the space that they're following these guidelines that you presented to us and you are excited um, about them? Yeah, I think Jump follows this. Uh, quite well, and we gathered some of these tactics from them. So Jump is significantly larger than we are at this point, but they grew in a very much a similar way of one batching, staying as a closed community, really thinking about who their members were. And Jump, for those who don't know, is a community of Web3 brand marketers um, and agencies. So most of the people in their community are people who are uh, really curious about Web3, working at large consumer brands, um, who are building um, building community building um, web three products within large web two companies and creating a shared identity among them? I think that they're definitely one to look for. Uh, they have had they have around I think two thousand five hundred members in their community, um, and they've been growing it for maybe almost a year and a half now. Um, so a little less intimate than Safari, but they also get a lot more get a lot more punch in terms of uh, who they can bring in within their community to speak because uh, they have more members to draw from. So I think they're a, another great example. And I've learned a lot from uh, Jeff as a community builder and watching what they do in, in, in Jump. No, thank you. Can you share us a link or uh, the name yeah. to Google it later? Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Here's the link to jump. Here's the link to Safari, which is our community. Hey, uh, Justin, I have a quick question. This has been awesome. And I feel like we're, we're learning a lot just as team members and just community members overall. Um, I'm curious, what do you, how do you decide on the topics on a weekly basis to discuss with the community when like everyone's coming from different backgrounds and different levels of experience? And how do you like level set that? Or is it just like, I don't know what you guys are talking about, but I assume it's something, you know, if you're, it's a practice type of oriented DAO, then, then you're like trying to improve everyone's skill sets. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that it starts from uh, who we let into the community is that we really center around Web 2 and Web 3 growth people. And one of our, our overarching theses for, for Web 2 growth people is that 
we have a unique ability and opportunity to onboard Web2 growth leaders into Web3, and the space will be better for it, not by teaching them about Web3, but by getting them excited about what it means to do Web3 growth. And so we expect that our community members either know about growth uh, and the fundamentals because they're a growth practitioner or they're a founder, uh, or they know about Web3. Um, so it is true that we, we spend less time talking at level setting about nitty gritties of uh, what is Web3 and those types of things, um, and more so talking about high level concepts and then case studies within them. So examples, examples of this and also this shifted uh, over time, as I mentioned. So, you know, when we first started Batch 2, uh, it was a lot of me talking to the community and doing taking on much more of an educator role. So one week we talked about the Web2 Web3 growth funnel, which is some of the slides that I shared before, shared in this presentation. And the next week we talked about Web3 growth loops, how that is playing out in communities. And then I talked a little bit about tactics that we use and we saw from other companies uh, using, communities using. Uh, we talked about decentralized storytelling, what it means to tell a story as a decentralized brand and as a community and get everyone to talk about the same story without you know, beating them over the head with it. Um, we talked about merging channels. We talked about Web3 data analytics. Uh, so that was a lot of the teaching elements. Uh, but more recently, so we take a different approach, which is really about having community members teach each other. Uh, and so it comes from following a very similar uh, format every time, is that I'm looking for, you know, what is the segment that is interesting, uh, and then how do people actually market to that segment? So a few weeks ago, we had the heads of growth from four different social token platforms talk about, or founders, uh, talk about what is it like to market to creators. So creators, the segment, what are the strategies used to market to them? The next week we had the John Wu, who some of you might be familiar with, who's in Safari, he's the head of growth at Aztec Network. Um, and also the head of growth at DSO, Ash, uh, talk about, you know, L1s, L2s, how to build ecosystems. So I'd say like most of these concepts are, are new in, in theory to most people, but they are grounded in familiar understandings around, you know, that's one of the core elements is if you control the segments that you let in, you know what, what information people are coming to the table with. And so we expect that people have a base level of Web3 knowledge and a base level of, of crypto knowledge um, at the minimum for, for our community. And so that's where we're able to mostly discuss a little bit more advanced topics um, than most communities might be able to. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, my other question, I know that TJ also had a question. Um, um, it was how do you how do you decide how do you match the members how, like how does that work? Definitely, uh, that's definitely a has been a challenge time and time again. Usually, we match people by trying to figure out um, is looking for Web three growth leaders that are in the same vertical. So, like whether it be NFTs, games, etc., but not necessarily direct competitors. But sometimes we do match direct competitors. We think especially in Web3, that it's good for people to know each other um, because, you know, for many of the industries that we're in, uh, people start with an initial product that is very broad and then they they narrow down as time goes on. So they might start as competitors but not, not be competitors in the long run as each of them differentiate. And competitors are some of the best people for us to learn from. So we think about it largely around that. Um, we probably could do a better job thinking about time zone and other things, but today, yeah, we know at a base level that people share the same types of characteristics of either being growth leaders or founders or what that means and uh, match them on that. And if they're coming from Web2, either try and match them with other people who are transition have told us that they're transitioning to full-time uh, Web3 or have recently transitioned um, or talk to a Web3 growth leader in their personal interest area. So it all depends, but it, as you might imagine, is a 
highly, highly manual, time-consuming effort to even match 80 people every couple months uh, together. Um, but as I mentioned, I, I really believe strongly that the things you do in onboarding really set up your community for success for the for the rest of their their life cycle. So I think that it's at least for Safari, it's been it's been worth it so far to do both the onboarding and the matching to uh, really ensure that people believe that the Safari network is a valuable network. That's super cool and really valuable. Thank you so much. Um, I guess I'll just quickly ask TJ's question. Uh, would you classify Jump as a community, communities of practice? Also Safari for that matter. Yeah, I think of both Jump and, and Safari as communities of practice is that, you know, we're kind of like industry communities. We're communities of people that share around the same job. Um, even though that job might be look different, but you, know, you could also say that you know founder communities or communities of practice. Sometimes the the lines will certainly get blurred if you know you have a, a community that is around a very specific segment, like a developer community, but it's to engage with the product. Um, but I think that we'll see a lot of these these lines blur as time goes on. Uh, for example, Safari and Jump, for that matter, both started as communities of practice. And Safari, we plan to launch a product and Jump also has different things that they're thinking about for what products um, and experiences might look like for them. So I think that the lines between communities of product and communities of practice will, will increasingly become blurred um, or might you know, differ at, at different stages of their, their community. Um, as I you know, mentioned before, I think it's important to remember that communities um, are, not, are not stagnant. Uh, segments and people change and communities also change. So um, we might be a community of practice today and a community of product tomorrow. Okay, we also have uh, one more question from uh... Mayan Kabugna. Uh, so he is asking, how do you attract funding if you advocate for building a smaller community? Uh, scale appears to be fundamental to every capital allocation today. So how do you get financer excited about a smaller uh, intimate uh, community? Yeah, I think this is the million dollar question. And I think that this, even for, for larger communities too, is that community builders are really under-resourced. And we saw this in the DAO tooling a hype bubble about six to, six, six to eight months ago, is that you had all these people trying to build tools for DAOs, and you had very few people building DAOs themselves. And I believe that the reason for that is because you can get funding to build a DAO tool, but you can't build, get that much funding uh, to build a DAO. Uh, you certainly can in the uh, beginning, if you're in a bull market, but during a bear market, it's very hard to get funding for communities uh, because there's usually a promise of what is the product that they're going to create together. So I think that this is still a really open question that is, I think, the most important question that Web3 as a space and community members in general need to be asking themselves today. I fundamentally believe, and I think that other people fundamentally believe that communities are the bedrock of, of Web3, um, but there's a not, it's, un, it's an untenable position for, for most community builders. So for example, you know, Safari, we don't charge, we don't charge for, for entrance. And I think that it, it changes, it significantly changes the dynamics of your community when you directly monetize it. Okay, like gate access um, or charge a subscription fee. Um, so I think it's it's something to be considered. I think that there's honestly not a great answer yet for the space. Um, but I, my hope is that ecosystems will uh, increasingly see the power of community and want to fund uh, communities in the same or give grants to communities more so um, in the same way that they do for, for tools.
Any other questions come to mind? Oh, if there are no other questions, I'll, I'll pass it back to, to Joyce and Alyssa. Okay, I mean, yeah. Uh, so, uh, if there is any other question that comes uh, in mind, yeah, you can uh, always type in public voice and we have uh, uh, Justin, uh, so he can uh, probably answer uh, any question there. So, yeah, I mean, uh, if there is no other question, I think uh, we can uh, uh, close this uh, workshop. Thanks again, Justin. It was really a uh, pleasure to hear you and also what Safari DAO is is doing and learn all all these uh, those those tips and I believe that also the members have benefits and have learned a lot of stuff uh, uh, from from you it was really a great way to open our workshop session so really appreciate and thanks uh, thanks uh, for for your time hopefully we will have uh, another workshop uh, in the in, in the future and learn more more about uh, from from you and also uh, how safari is is doing thanks everyone it was great being here and and thanks for inviting me yeah, thank you. And thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thanks Justin. Bye.